Well, I don't have a uh, classical uh, culinary background like most chefs uh, that went to culinary school. I was lucky enough to uh, be self-taught and uh, work in the school of hard knocks, so to speak. Uh, I started out in the uh, Hyatt in Tampa and uh, had a great chef uh, who really uh, mentored me and taught me that it's not so much about uh, ingredients and food as as much as running a kitchen. I mean, there are two different thought processes on that. Some people, it's all about the food. Uh, it's great to know about all the food, but if you can't run a kitchen properly, then uh, I think you're going to be deficient in everything you're going to try. So he taught me how to be a, a great culinary manager, how to run my staff, how to do food costs, how to do uh, you know labor costs and all those technical things about you know I'm the kind of chef that likes to make money for either myself or the company that I'm working for and I have a definitely a proven track record with that. This goes back to when I was actually in the Boy Scouts. Uh, I would go to summer camp. Up at summer camp I'd get to cook uh, breakfast, lunch, or dinner sometimes for the rest of my troop and yeah we had like spices and you know dried herbs and things like that so I'd throw my twist on it or whatever you know make some omelets and just you know throw something else in it a little secret ingredient and the compliments I received from everybody was like oh god you make this better than my mom you know was just and to have somebody like put something in their mouth and watch their heads roll back their eyes roll back and their head going oh god I mean, it was a feeling that I really was, it was contagious. It's like, I want that feeling every time I cook for somebody. So when it came time, my uh, parents actually, my dad was like, well, what do you want to do with your life? And I told him I wanted to go to the Culinary Institute of America uh, and become a chef. Unfortunately, this was not going to be the case with him because back in the 80s, uh, chefs were not considered the professional celebrity men of stature, white collar people that they are today. They were, you know, just really looked down upon. Uh, they didn't make the kind of money they make today. So he wanted me to go into something a little bit more with a, you know, lucrative endeavor or, you know, something that he thought might have a, more of a future. Uh, he, of course, today is as proud as he possibly could be. So, I mean, he and he loves, you know, all I do and he's always been supportive of what I'm doing now. But uh, like I said, it was a person who my neighbor brought me down to a meeting of the American Culinary Federation as a guest. At the time, I was renting cars for Avis Rent-A-Car. So I was just pl totally blown away. At first I was intimidated, you know, here's all these guys with these beautiful, you know, decorative white chef jackets. And, you know, it's like, there's no stains on those jackets and they're, you know, they're clean shaven and they don't smell, you know, they're, they're real professionals and I was at first intimidated but then they were like so friendly to me and open you know even though I wasn't a chef that I fell in love with it right there and you know redirected all my focus and said this is what I really I want to go back to doing this uh, I got the textbooks that they give you at Johnson Wales and the Culinary Institute of America started reading them started watching a lot of TV started practicing on my own and when I was ready I took a part-time job uh, in Garmage at the Hyatt and so I was, there I was, and I also joined the ACF as a junior member. Uh, I think being an ACF member is probably the most important step that myself or anybody who wants to be a great chef should take in their life because of the networking and the knowledge that is passed on among these professionals. Uh, it's second to none. Um, I would like to consider myself more as a managerial chef than an artistic chef. Uh, you know, I don't usually delve in putting things on plates with tweezers and, you know, all that, uh, you know, exotic things. Um, I want to make sure that uh, what I'm creating is something that can be done quickly, efficiently, cost effectively, and uh, will also at the same time taste amazing. <laughs> I actually uh, don't usually create elaborate things at home uh, unless I'm competing in a culinary competition getting a recipe together then it's like you know okay we made this really cool dish and now we get to eat it but believe it or not as simple as I possibly can if it could be rolled up in a pita or spread on bread or 
you know, cooked in one pot in five minutes, I am perfectly happy with it. It's like I can grab, uh, I could eat hot dogs, you know, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner if I wanted to. It's just my days off kind of are pretty lousy with my uh, tastes. But, you know, I, I'm surrounded by great ingredients all the time. So, uh, you know, it's like a break from it. It's, you know, you, you're, you're a little sin. You know, some people like, the, you know, you look at pastry chefs getting to use all those great things. But then on their day off, they're eating Susie Q's and Hostess Twinkies. It's like, oh, I can't believe that. Honestly, the must-have ingredient are always fresh herbs. I think that depending on the knowledge of the use of fresh herbs can seriously enhance a dish. If you don't have these ingredients to finish with at the end, to garnish with, to you know, make that extra you know, flavor pop at the end, I think that you're missing out on uh, what you've envisioned your dish to be. Well, most people know me also as the Greyhound Chef. Uh, the reason being is I am a huge advocate of the uh, eventual adoption into their forever homes of retired racing greyhounds. I actually have owned a couple in my life and one is here with me today. Uh, when I adopted my last one, I uh, asked the rescue group, Greyhound Pets of America, Greater Orlando, I said, what can I do to help you guys out? I mean, I have an idea for an event maybe that'll raise some money to help you guys because uh, all the this is an organization that 100% of the feeding and care and uh, you know the electricity that the kennel uses I mean it's all by donors donation only so or by a charity event so I figured let's do one really good charity event that might uh, help alleviate a huge chunk of their uh, bills so I have a lot of uh, friends in the industry who uh, are chefs and I decided to call on them and I said let's do a charity event where it's very, very similar on the same lines of Taste of the Nation or uh, Cattle Baron's Ball you know those high profile events where people will come in uh, buy a ticket we'll have 20 chefs all with tables and they can come up and have uh, you know a lot of you know taste tasting portions, have the liquor and wine and beer companies serving out sample portions, and we'll have a silent and live auction besides that, and we'll raise money. Uh, and they thought about that, and then they contacted me back in August uh, a few years ago and said, let's try to make this happen. So the first Great Plates took place, and uh, it was on a small scale. We had it at uh, the Holy Trinity Conference Center in Maitland, and uh, we raised about twelve thousand dollars the first time it was a great event people were spoke really positive and for the next two years we held it there again and uh, we raised more money each time you know we got up uh, last year was about twenty thousand twenty two thousand so unfortunately with all the success of an event sometimes you run into the problem of running out of space and it had become clear that we outgrew the venue so this year we have partnered with the Rose and Shingle Creek and it is going to be held Tuesday, December 16th at the Rose and Shingle Creek. Uh, we have a massive ballroom. Uh, we've got enough room for everybody to you know, mix, mingle. Not everybody's gonna have like elbows against each other. It's just gonna, a beautiful venue. It's during Christmas time. So all the Christmas trees and lights and everything, it's gonna be just a huge festive holiday uh, extravaganza of a event and we already have at least uh, 17 18 chefs uh, committed to it including uh, I have uh, three three celebrity chefs uh, I have uh, Emily Ellen from Food Network star and Cupcake Wars uh, Jillian Hopke who has won Cupcake Wars twice and uh, Paul Joachim who's known as the chocolate genius who does these amazing sculptures out of chocolate. I mean, some of them are lifelike and some of them you can do in a matter of 30 minutes. So just, it, we have some great items for the silent auction, great items for the live auction. And uh, for a ticket price, honestly, most of those other high profile events are usually quite expensive, you know, 75 to $100 a person. Great Plates is only $35 in advance forty dollars at the door I mean shoot you can't even go out for dinner for a pr that kind of price 
and you're going to get all you can eat and you're going to get to sample all these great foods. And I think one of the most beautiful things about Great Plates is that 100% of the money that is raised goes immediately and directly towards these dogs. It's not like uh, some of these other uh, events where it has to wait a while before that money trickles down or they have to figure out what the use is. I mean, the next day after it and they've collected the money, checks are being written to the veterinarian who performs all the medical care for it. Checks are being uh, written out so they can get food in the kennel. The electric bill is getting paid. I mean, it's you see the difference. And the, uh, the kennel holds about 50 retired racing greyhounds at any one time. And throughout the year, I'd say they filter or a rescue of 300, uh, well actually not rescue, uh, adopt, have the adoption of about 300 of these dogs. So it's a never ending process and sometimes depending on how these uh, dogs come to us from the track, uh, medical can be uh, quite high because sometimes they come out with hip displacement or uh, broken legs. So that has to be covered. My Greyhound is, uh, his name is Picasso. Uh, I had one Greyhound previously, his name was Rembrandt, so I decided to stay on the uh, artist names with uh, my dogs. Uh, after Rembrandt had uh, passed away after 14 years, I uh, went to Gre Greyhound Pets of America, Greater Orlando, and uh, told him what I wanted in a dog. Uh, my wife was a little uh, antsy at first because, you know, although she was used to, to Rembrandt, a new greyhound, especially a younger greyhound, uh, I got him when he was only uh, about three years old. And he is 90 pounds, although he doesn't look it, and he runs about 40 miles an hour. So it's very intimidating for my wife, who's about five foot nothing, to have this dog run past her at that speed. She's like, ah! But uh, as you, uh, I mean, his personality, he very much tends to mellow out. Uh, and as you, the longer you have them, the, the more they shrink. You know, they're not as big after a while. I mean, when you first meet one, you realize you could just basically lay your hand on its back without even bending down. Uh, but after a while, they just become normal small dogs.